nice to meet you all, um, and thanks for being here today. We're going to talk about how AI is impacting the commercial side of um, the pharmaceutical industry. My name is Chris Mancy. Um, I'm a cl clinician by background and the co-founder and CEO of Viz AI. And I'm delighted to welcome Greg Myers, um, who is the Chief Digital and Technology Officer of Bristol Myers Squibb. Great to be here with you, Chris. So, um, Greg, you know, the IRA throws up important challenges for the whole industry. You know, how do we launch therapies faster and more broadly so that more patients can benefit? Um, from your point of view, um, as, as the Chief Digital Technology Officer of a large biopharma company, where have you found uh, there are opportunities for AI to make a difference to your business, especially thinking about digital health, um, patient care pathways, et cetera? Yeah, so when we think about uh, digital and, and AI particularly, I think we're pretty singular focused on trying to accelerate discovery, design, and development of novel medicines, right? We want to bring more medicines to more patients faster, and I've seen a lot of progress there. I think what maybe is a little unique to us, which we talk more than most people about, is really also taking on some responsibility to try to transform clinical care. And if you think of, I mean, cancer is probably a great example. You know, the average cancer patient will fail in the first two to three lines of therapy before they find something works. If you have something like lung cancer, you don't, you don't have a year many times, so you don't have time to get to the right therapy. And I think as more and more real-world data is generated, as, as it becomes easier and easier to collect the biomeasurements, and then process those measurements, you have the opportunity to really what we think is to fundamentally transform the diagnosis, treatment, and monitoring of patients. And I think we're already leaders in that space. We're the only uh, biopharma company that has launched two digital health products to the market over the last 12 months. And uh, we do think probably in 20 years or so, every pharma company will probably have to launch with a molecule, some digital wrapper around it to make sure that when it gets into the clinical context and the clinical setting, that patients get the best outcomes for it. And, and I think that's really what we, we've been focused on. I think that's so important. You know, as a, I previously was a was practicing clinician um, in the neurology and neurosurgery field, and I worked in an ivory tower institution, and it was so um, obvious to me that the patients who got to our institution got the treatments, got better outcomes, than the ones who were maybe one mile down, down the road. Yeah. And so this idea of patient access to care is, is so important. And, and I agree with your vision in 20 years that we want this companion type workflow that gets patients to the right place. Well, I mean, I'm curious, Chris, when you, when you started the company, you had kind of an idea of how you think AI would make its way into a clinic. I mean, how has that evolved? And, you know, maybe explain a little bit about what Viz AI does and how you've approached that problem. Yeah, so I think our unique innovation was to combine the AI diagnosis or detection of disease with a, a, a workflow. So getting the patient to the right place. Because the AI is very good at picking up disease in scans, whether it's a brain aneurysm or a stroke in a brain scan or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that we've launched together um, in an EKG. Um, but if that information doesn't get to the right place, typically a specialist who knows how to diagnose the patient, often ordering ne the, you know, the next test, maybe an echo, um, and then knows how to make a decision about treatment, that patient doesn't benefit. That's right. So our approach to AI has really been leveraging AI as a population health tool, find more patients, but then build a technology workflow and combine it with a, um, we call it our clinical ses success model, where we go into hospitals and enact change management. Right. You know, our goal, in fact, our mission at Viz is to increase access to life-saving treatments, life and limb-saving treatments. Um, and if you want to double the number of patients, triple the number of patients who are getting an appropriate treatment, the AI itself won't work. Yeah. You have to organize the workflow to get that patient to the right place. That's right, yeah, that's interesting. Um, so, um, w what are some ways that you've begun applying AI at BMS to bridge the gap in commercial efficacy and effectiveness? Yeah, I mean, I think probably a good story, and I'll t talk about a project that we've done with Viz. Um, and I, I think if you think about the traditional, um, well, so, so if you think about BMS, so we, we've been leaders in oncology for a long time. And, you know, whether it's we're pioneers in immuno oncology, pioneers in cell therapy, We've got ADCs with the uh, proposed announcement of to acquire Ray's Bio. We'll be in radio pharmaceuticals. And so we think there's this other angle, though, around any major disease area, which re really is around trying to elucidate uh, sort of the pharmacological profiles of potential medicines and match them with the unique disease biology. And that's not always the same thing from patient to patient. 
And so as we think about those abilities to um, diagnose, treat, and monitor patients, we think that there is this sort of really sort of beautiful coupling that can happen. Uh, and we can maybe talk a little bit about sort of the, how the commercial model of, of pharmaceuticals is changing. We can get into that example. But it's this real shift where we, we actually do think that as it becomes more and more complicated, even in oncology, for an oncologist to try to manage T cell engagers and ADCs and radio ligand, and the, it's really, really going to be very difficult. And they're not getting, it's not getting any easier for them. So the ability to bring tools to bear that can help them understand how patients are best going to benefit, to be able to look at uh, longitudinally whether or not disease burden is getting better or worse, whether or not the therapeutic effect is doing what it's supposed to, early warning signs of safety signals. These are all things that AI has the ability to, to bring to market, and that's something that we're committed to doing. Yeah, medicine is getting more and more specialized, and it's impossible to keep up with the exponentially increasing amount of you know, new data. Um, and you know, unless you happen to have been to that recent conference, yep. you, know, you might miss you know, the, the new way to diagnose and treat a patient yep. um, and to monitor that patient. So um, that resonates with me a lot. Look, I, I think one of the biggest problems in healthcare is the variability in care that patients receive. You know, if you are seen by a specialist in your disease, an HGM specialist, an aneurysm specialist, the likelihood of getting guideline-directed care is extremely high. You know, if you go to the clinic next door, the likelihood of getting guideline-directed care is extremely low. Yeah. Right? And, and really, healthcare is a hub-and-spoke game. You've got specialists living in that specialist hospital who serve maybe 40, 50, sometimes 80 other hospitals where you don't even have a cardiologist yeah. in those hospitals to read the EKG, never mind someone who specializes in the disease. Yeah. And so it's a big problem, and it's a big problem for this industry, right? you're making amazing therapies that truly do save lives. Yeah. Um, but we wanna get those out to more patients, and we'll get them out to more patients faster. Pride of Viz um, HCM, which is the HCM module that detects uh, HCM in an EKG, I think the median time to diagnosis for HCM is about five years. Yeah, about five years, yeah. Yeah, and you can take that down to five weeks by getting that patient flagged to the right specialist, booking them in for an echo into clinic. You know, it's even worse, like Greg mentioned, that when they don't get diagnosed and they just drop down dead. And actually a good friend of mine, age 18, that happened to, and so it's a problem that's near and dear to my heart. Um, so, so, um, so Greg, um, you know, what are other areas of unmet me needs that you would like uh, companies like ours and others in the digital space um, to focus on? Yeah, I mean, I think cardiology has been really, kind of a really easy place to start. I mean, easy, but uh, I mean, the, you know, the, the heart is truly the only digital organ we have. It's either polarized or depolarized, zero and one. Uh, I think when you get into other areas like oncology, there's a huge need, uh, unmet need in trying to figure out selection. Um, there's a, I, mean, there's, I think I've met at least 10 different digital pathology companies walking around these halls uh, this week alone. There's so much opportunity to bring stuff that is, that are kind of already happening in the clinical space, whether that's digital pathology, other sorts of, Im anything that has an imaging modality, MRI, chest x-ray, high-res CT scan. I mean, we, 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 we've been talking about um, an interest in looking at whether or not you can take something like um, a, a high-res uh, CT scan, which is actually quite, um, you know, depending on where you live in the U.S., may not be so easy to get, to get one of those. Can you actually swap that down to something like just a standard chest x-ray by applying deep learning, you know, are there actual signatures inside those images? So I think any place where you have images uh, or any sort of high resolution data, you have two common things. One is a ton of hidden patterns in data because human beings, we look at colors and images and computers look at pixels on a scale of zero to 256, much, much more finely grained. And the other thing is a high variability in terms of expertise and experience in looking at them as opposed to a model where one model can see every uh, MRI ever created, you know, one neurologist is gonna see maybe 10,000 in their career. So you, you think about that opportunity, any place where you have imaging modalities or blood assays or anything where there's highly quanti quantitative, uh, high fidelity information, there's probably an opportunity to find some breakthrough either in, in diagnosis, selection, treatment, uh, or monitoring. Yeah, I agree with that. And the technology is getting 
um, significantly better. We took a huge leap you know, with generative AI and what it can do both in large language models but also imaging. And so we will be able to create a companion uh, detection diagnostic workflow type tool for every you know, new treatment that, that comes to the fore. Um, you know, how quickly do you see this happening? How quickly do you see um, healthcare and pharmaceutical companies adopting this? Yeah, I think, I think for, um, they, they co-travel uh, for sure. And look, it's an industry that has a ton of inertia in it. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of practice inertia. I think uh, physicians are used to doing things a certain way. I think when you even look at imaging, the, the, you know, it sounds great to apply AI to images, but the vast majority of path labs are still sitting in slides. They're not actually in a digitized form. Yeah. So, but I think we had this situation with EMRs maybe 15 years ago. You know, it kind of started off real slow, and then as it gets more and more mature, now you can start to unlock Gen AI technologies underneath the hood there. So I think, like, like anything else, most innovation that I've seen in different industries tends to move. The impact is much bigger than you could anticipate, but it tends to move a lot slower than you yeah. think it's going to work. So this is probably measured out in decades. But I definitely think, like in this case uh, we just explained, I mean, I really do believe the algorithm that we put out has already saved lives this year. Um, I believe that uh, the algorithms that we built in for AFib detection have already saved lives. They've stopped, they've prevented strokes. So I think that it's not like this either all or nothing. I think that there's a gradient with which you can make a difference. And at BMS, this has really been our focus, is where do we think the first domino is likely to fall? Which therapeutic area? Which unmet medical need? Which disease area? And I think you attack that, you try to demonstrate some value, and then you kind of build off of that momentum. Yeah, it's been very impressive to see how you see where the, the you skate to where the puck is going. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you put patients first to make sure they do get those treatments. I think from our perspective, you know, where are we in the adoption curve? You know, we, we launched uh, the first FDA-approved AI algorithm in 2018. It was in the ischemic stroke space. That's now being adopted in 1,500 hospitals, covers around 230 million lives. So interestingly, in certain fields like neurology, now starting cardiology, AI within hospitals and clinics has crossed the chasm. Yeah. And I think that means that we're gonna see accelerating adoption within hospitals. When you start to see the benefits of these tools as a clinician, they stop becoming some fancy technology, they become a must have, just day to day, you, you need it. Yeah. Um, and I think that's very exciting for our space. Yeah, I agree, and I think if you look at the, if you even look at the, the demographic challenges, we, you know, at least just take the US alone, it is an aging population who is getting sicker with more and more comorbidities, and we're not getting a lot more doctors, and we're getting fewer nurses and actually fewer specialists per capita. Yeah. Like the average doctor is somewhere around 62, 63 years old in the US, so, if you really play this out, uh, I think there's a real opportunity, and, I, and I, sometimes it, 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 the, the conversation gets a little lazy around AI replacing doctors, like that's not my base case at all. But I think if you think about the ability to take, to make generalists more special, the example I love to use is that um, a convolutional neural net is about as accurate as a really good dermatologist in determining the difference between a benign uh, and, and a malignant skin lesion. Uh, and that dermatologist is about seven times more accurate than a GP. So the transient property is if you put those AIs in the tools of the hands of GPs, yeah. they're about as good as a dermatologist is in doing something as simple as a mole screen. And when you get out of the US and you go to places like India and China, there aren't that many dermatologists. Yeah. Uh, so you really have the opportunity to bring these tools in a way to act as co-pilots that I think increasingly will allow you know, sort of more of the front line, think about you know, uh, nurse practitioners, registers, nurse, the ability to allow them to do more versus having to wait for the months and months to get through a referral for something that could be as simple as reading you know, an MRI to, to, to spec something out. So I think this to me is where the puck is going. I think it's very exciting and we should all be rooting for it. I agree. Well, thank you very much today. Um, and thank you very much for listening to us all today. You've, You've heard that AI is here today. Um, it's got exciting potential both for patients, helping them get to treatment, but also for the pharmaceutical industry. I think both of us feel like every future um, molecule that, that treats a patient should get to as many patients as possible, and that technology has the ability to do that. Um, do I have time for audience questions? Um, I think we have maybe one. one. Okay, we have time for one question. Mike. Does anyone have a question? 
Ah, it's two here. Oh. I went right up front. I got it. Here we go. Hi. So um, I am Anupam Agarwal. I'm a cardiologist. So I was wondering, um, in your pulmonary embolism suit, uh, did you ever try to include the EKG? Because one of the EKG findings is very specific specific, though specificity and sensitivity is not as high. It is between 50 to 60 percent. So there is specific pattern, S1, Q, Q3, T3 uh, pattern. So I, I was just wondering. This is for, for oh, P. Yeah. So <laughs> we, we have two FDA cleared modules in P, one that works on a CT pulmonary angiogram and one that works on, a, um, on the CT, but does RV-LV ratio. I think that's a great idea. I think that's what's starting to happen now. You can have co conversations with the FDA. Normally, you're clearing each algorithm separately because they're testing it against a specialist, right? Can it read a ECG or a CT as well as the relevant specialist? And that's how you determine the ground truth. That's how you determine the sensitivity and specificity. But you're absolutely right, in clinical medicine, we combine tests. We don't look at one, we look at two, three, and then we make an, a, a decision. Um, and that's what we're starting to do now, and I think it's, it's the future. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Greg. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you.